stories which are a bit of a mix of both and much more besides. There'll be stories of sin and fear, stories of desire, hope, longing, joy, stories of wanting the best for your family, but not quite knowing how to, how to do it or getting it wrong. And there'll be stories of silent, untold sorrow, suffering at the hands of others, stories of small but real victories, which no one knows about or very few people know about. There'll be stories of little ones who never had a name. There'll be stories of moving around place to place looking for a home and perhaps being forced to move from one's home, uprooted from the place you love, being forced to be a refugee. We sung earlier, Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our sins and fears release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel, strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. So what life story is each one of us in today? What are our fears? What are our sins? Our hopes, our desires? What's the longing in our hearts? So have you heard that saying, all of life is here? Well, all of life is here in the reading we had from Matthew's Gospel. And all of life is here in Cowley, in East Oxford, in Oxford, Oxfordshire, wherever we are. All of life is here. What does that phrase mean? It means that the many different paths which lives take are seen in the Gospel reading we had and in the communities and the places we love and we hope and pray that all of life is in the church worldwide of which we are a part. So people have always been very interested in, um, in life stories and they, um, and they tend to tell those stories often in books. So I was going to show you a few life stories. We've got the Bible as the basic life story. Here's one. This lovely book, Whistle Stop Tales, which tells the story of many of the figures which we heard about in uh, the Gospel reading by setting them in their original context, in Iran or wherever it is. Here's another man, uh, William Grimshaw. He was um, a minister in uh, the north of England. And Wesley, actually the brother of Wesley, John Wesley, whose um, song we sang earlier, said, I've been for some days with Mr Grimshaw a few such as him would make a nation tremble. He carries fire wherever he goes. And this book tells the story of his life. Here's somebody else. I mentioned him a few weeks ago. A book just given to my son Peter the other day for his birthday, Alaudo Equiano, an amazing life story. Having been a slave and then becoming a, a leading figure in this society, teaching us how we should live. And here's another life story our late loved Queen. An amazing life told in this very thick book which I have not finished reading. <laughs> I'm not sure anyone has, to be honest. Here's another one, Pauline Hamilton. Life turned around from deep dark places to be a, an amazing minister of the Gospel. Another life story, David Watson, great inspiration for many people in, uh, in England. A life transformed, a minister who was incredibly hospitable, full of the life of Jesus, and uh, led many people to the Lord. Here's another life story. Alan Johnson, formerly a postman, became the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and uh, his own autobiography is here. Quite a good read, actually. Very interesting guy, Alan Johnson. Johnny Bairstow, one of my cricketing uh, heroes. Um, very moving family story. Very kind of troubled life in many ways. Quite amazing what he does now. And here's one of my favourites, a beautiful book called Grenfell Hope. Do you remember Grenfell Tower? This is a book written by my friend Gabby Doherty, who um, she and her husband lived opposite <coughs> Grenfell Tower. Her husband, Sean, was the first minister on the scene when Grenfell was burning. 
And these are the stories of the people who lived in Grenfell, stories of families. We love thinking about stories. Stories matter for us hugely, life stories. So think of your life story. And perhaps think of one story of someone you know. It could be someone in this church, in the neighbourhood, among your friends. As we've been saying, Advent's a time when we long for light amidst darkness. So what is dark or gloomy at the moment in your life or in your friends or family? What light do you long for? What are the fears? What's the hope you hold on to? What are the joys? And whatever all those things are, Christ is calling you, especially at Advent, coming to Christmas, to bring those fears and hopes and joys into the light of his kingdom. How do we know that? That's where our Gospel reading helps us in Matthew chapter 1. We heard loads of names. We heard a lot of life. And if we look carefully, as we're going to in a moment, we'll see many of the longings, the fears, the desires, the hopes, the sins, the joys. And with each of those names, Matthew is stirring us to see how all of life comes together in Jesus the Messiah. He shows us the one story in the life of one family, So let's listen to that story now. If you've got your Bibles open, please have a look down at uh, verse verse 2. I'm going to think through some of these figures and see what significance they have for us. So think there about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in verse 2. Abraham, a wandering Aramean, longing for a child, journeying to a home. He's fearing the people he meets. He sins against his wife. But amidst all that, he still has faith in the Lord who promised to him. Then there's Isaac, the longed-for baby boy, promised by God. He was that little boy that Sarah rejoiced over. And the boy who, at God's command, was nearly killed on a mountain until God provided a ram, a substitute, in his place. Isaac then grew up to marry Rebekah and be the father of Esau and Jacob. Then we're on to Jacob. He longed for his brother's inheritance and he nicked it, he gained it, he stole it through trickery. He was full of fear, he ran away, but then he was reconciled with his brother. Then he became a father of many sons, like Judah. There he is in the passage. And Judah, who was one of the people who abused Joseph. We think of the whole Joseph story. Then look on to verse 5. There's Boaz, whose mother, or perhaps grandmother, these genealogies sometimes skip generations, mother, perhaps grandmother, was Rahab. Who was Rahab? She was an ingenious woman. She saved Jewish men from death. She was also known to be a prostitute. And then there's Ruth, if you look on, the outsider, who loved Naomi, her mother-in-law. Their husbands both died. And then Ruth, she was destitute, But God knit her into Abraham's family through Boaz, that son of Rahab. Ruth, whose then great-grandson, was King David. You get the idea. It's a mixed picture of a family story. Let's think about David. Verse 6, anointed with oil. Uh, David, we were, uh, if if you were a hero of the summer, we were thinking about some of his psalms, his songs. Songs which are full of longing and hope and love and pain and joy. Those psalms which reach deep down into our own hopes and fears. David, who was then persecuted by the powerful, but protected by the Lord. David, who then killed Uriah to steal his wife, Bathsheba. David, who was victorious in battle by the Lord's will. And David, who then secured a homeland for the children of Abraham and became uh, a great king. But what kind of king was he? He was a king who had wisdom, yes, but who abused women. Just like Solomon, if you look at verse 7, that's what Solomon's story was about. A king had wisdom, but was a, uh, uh, had up to 700 wives. David was a king who kills to get what he wants. If you look on to verse 8, Jehoram, he killed six of his brothers to secure the throne. 
but David was also a king who loved God's law. If you look on to verse 11, you've got Josiah. He found again the book of the law in the back corner of the temple, made sure it was dusted off, got out, and longed to bring the people back to God. That's the kind of family story that leads us towards Jesus. There's longing there, there's desire, there's hope. But Matthew wants us to know that Josiah's longing actually was disappointed because the people had gone too far in their sin and so God punished them. In fact, God uprooted them out of their home and took them on to exile in Babylon. What was exile about? Exile was a time of loss and lament, it's great sorrow and forced migration. For the exiles, their story was all about longing, a longing to go home. And then in verse 12, the family story changes. God opens a way for Jeconiah and Shealtiel and the others to return to the land. What a joy that must have been. But actually life in Israel, in Judah, when they return, is never, is never as good as it was before. The light fades, the darkness enters in again, the new occupiers arrive, Antiochus Epiphanes, and then the Romans, and then verses 13 to 15, we've got a dreary generation after dreary generation, greater suffering, greater loss, all the way down to Jacob, verse 16. Jacob, who was the father of Joseph, the Joseph we saw in the wonderful nativity just now. So Matthew is showing us that all of Israel and Judah's life is here, in these verses. All of human life is depicted here, as we're given a picture of it. We've got fears, we've got longings, joys, sins, disappointments, light and darkness. Abraham's family is a chosen family, is given by God's grace special gifts to share with the world. And Abraham's family show us how the Lord of the whole world keeps on loving humans, keeps on loving us. Not just Israel, not just Judah, but every nation on earth. And that's what the coming of the Messiah finally shows. That's what the whole story is building to in verse 16. Matthew wants to teach us that Jesus really is part of the family of Abraham. How is he part of that family? If you have a look in verse 16, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. So Matthew is teaching us very explicitly, very clearly, that, G that, that Joseph is not Jesus' biological father. If you look back through the genealogy, he's often said the father of, the father of. In this line, he says the husband of. He's creating a distance, if you like, between Jesus and Joseph, unlike anyone else before in this family tree. Jesus is not the son of Joseph, but he is, back to verse 1, he's showing us, Matthew is showing us, that Jesus really is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's fulfilling everything that Abraham and David and the exile was pointing towards. But he's doing that by coming into the family in a way unlike anyone before him. So Jesus is part of the family story, but he joins it in a way which brings that story into an amazing new chapter. He's long expected, he comes as the Messiah, he's the anointed king. And when we hear the word king, we think again of all those kings I was talking about earlier, David and Solomon and so on. But Jesus is a new king. He's not a king who kills. He's not a king who abuses. He's not a king who steals. He's the long expected king. He's a messiah who will be all that a king should be, all that we should long for in a king and rejoice to see. He's a king of justice and love and mercy and joy and hope and he's totally without sin. 
He's the king who fulfills all the promises about God's, God's kingdom. And that sense of fulfillment is what Matthew wants us to see from verse 17 at the end of the passage. Do you see that? 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 to the exile, 14 to the Messiah, verse 17. See, seven is a number which means completion. And double seven, 14, means really complete. And three times double seven means really, really complete. See, all of life, all those fears, sins, joys, longings, hopes, successes, failures, desires, all coming together in Jesus. You know what three times double seven is? 42. See, 42 really is the meaning of life. <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide, anyone? Yeah, okay, there we go. 42 really is the meaning of life. Everything does come together in Jesus. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. That's the beauty of this passage. It's so wonderful. And not just for Abraham's family. Remember what the story of Abraham's family is really all about. It's about the blessing of all the nations. You can remember, what is the promise which is given to Abraham, who becomes Abraham, Abraham, the father of many? The promise is that all nations on earth will be blessed through you. And here we are now. We're people from several nations gathered in this building. And we're in a city where very, very many nations gather in Jesus' name. How many Brazilian churches are, are there in this city? Anyone know? Twelve. There are twelve Brazilian churches in this city. Many Chinese churches. Many churches from many nations in this city. God is doing this. It's in a world where billions now look forward to Christmas. All those children of Abraham. What was promised to Abraham has become reality through the Messiah, Jesus. So let's now take a deep breath and think back to our own stories, our stories as a community of people here. Every person here has a story. And for each of us, the invitation of Advent, of this beautiful genealogy, is to listen. To listen to each other's stories in the light of the Messiah, Jesus. Perhaps at the moment we might know Abraham's or David's story or Ruth's story, but we don't know so much perhaps about each other's stories. Maybe we do, that's wonderful. Just as we listen to that nativity story, which is so beautifully done, thank you Johanna and the whole team, that was so amazing. Just as we listen to that nativity story, let's listen to each other's stories and pray for everyone's stories to be fulfilled in Jesus. We know that there are hard things in life stories. Hard, thing, hard things perhaps in your life story. Things which have happened to us, things we have done or seen or been through. If there's something you want to talk about or pray about, please do talk to Ben or Shalom or Shep or me, someone you trust here in the church perhaps in your missional community. We would love to listen and to pray and to journey uh, with you. But, look at, we, but looking beyond ourselves, what are the stories in Cowley right now, coming towards an end now? Think about the stories of families, households, facing the normal, everyday troubles which sin brings. We all need the forgiveness, the healing of the kingdom of heaven through Jesus. Stories of being refugees, of seeking asylum here, looking for the welcome which the kingdom of heaven offers to all people. And there are stories in our nation now of how government, in Jesus' day and now, require refugees to go far away and register. It's wonderful to see that picture of us, us going down to um, uh, Portland. God can still use even that. What about stories of Cowley, the place where we are right now? What it was like in years gone by, 
what it will be like. As you probably know, there are plans to redevelop Templar Square. There's a new consultation in 2024. But what are the fears? What are the concerns about? Availability of affordable housing, fear of crime, fear about what this community will look like in the future. The gospel of Jesus the Messiah matters for all of life here. And the invitation of this genealogy, I think, is to live in one another's stories, in our neighbours' stories, in the stories of this place, and to invite others into our own. And why is that? Well, all of life is here, and all of life meets in Jesus. So all of these stories here will meet finally again in Jesus. This is a little uh, Gospel of Matthew, which I'm going to try and stand up on the top here. We'll see if it does. Um, all of these stories meet in Jesus, the Messiah. They all come to their meaning, their fulfilment, their conclusion in Jesus, the Messiah. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Knew that would fall off. Um, okay. We all want Jesus to be in all of our lives. And as we look forward, we're looking forward to how life comes together in Jesus' return. That's what Advent's about. So as we wait in Advent, as we look forward to Christmas, we're thinking about how the Messiah was born to save us. Think about those longings, those hopes, those fears in your life story, in the life story of someone you care about. All our lives need rescuing from sin. And Jesus brings forgiveness of sins, and Jesus comes to change the human story, to change our stories, to save our desires and our hopes from taking the wrong direction, to give us a new goal for our desires, a new reason for hope. So, if you look back through that genealogy, you can see that all of life really is in the life of the family of Jesus. All of life is here in Cowley, in Oxford, and all of life meets finally in Jesus. Our prayer and our hope is that all of life will welcome Jesus the Messiah, the King who loves to save us. And our prayer is that at this Advent and this Christmas time, each of us will be living in that hope. I'm going to read again the words from uh, one of the songs we sung earlier. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and our sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength, Israel who we've been seeing the whole genealogy of Jesus coming through, Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are our Messiah. You are where all our stories are heading. You are the beginning and the end. We worship you and we pray that as we journey through Advent to Christmas and as we look to bless others as we go, we would find our rest in you. In the name of Jesus. Amen.